Good morning, everybody. Welcome. June 29th, 2020. I was harassed by a neighbor. Well, he lives a couple blocks down and one block over. But I was walking with my mask on outside. And he decided to start yelling at me, calling me a sheep. Then started to insult Black Lives Matter. Then he shouted, Tim Pool predicted all this two years ago. I responded, Tim Pool, that guy that got all of his reporting about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's recent election so completely wrong that he quote unquote lost his voice on the day she won. <laughs> that ass clown. My neighbor proceeded to attempt more insults to which I said, black lives do matter, wear a mask to protect your neighbors, and go read a book about the Spanish flu, sir. Get some help. Yes, he was white. Yes, he had long hair. Probably living a life not that great for him. You know, a moron. Someone this country needs less of, let alone in my neighborhood. So another thing happened. We have dumpers and trespassers that like to cruise through our alley sometimes. And we, as a neighborhood need to collectively work as a team because the cops in the city are not going to help us. We call the cops. They say, well, if it's not actively happening in process, nobody's in danger. We can't come scope it out. And the city's like, well, we'll send waste management to come pick it up. So by the time you send waste management to pick up these bags that smell like rotting milk, our alleyway is going to look even more disgusting and more people are going to be tempted to dump there. So I put on all my uh, protective equipment, went and poked the bags to make sure there was no human remains or anything crime related. Uh, and then I was able to rebag all the bags and throw them in my dumpster to be collected this morning. And then I had my other neighbors come by and they started to talk to me and say, hey, we got to do something. Well, we have our cameras. We recorded the assholes that dumped the trash and I have their license plate. So now it's OK. What are our next steps? One of the steps may be for me to sit outside next to my campfire with my shotgun and see if anybody comes down that alleyway. Not exactly what I'd like to do, but I'm willing to do it. I mentioned to my neighbors that I could take lead on this and rent that U-Haul van again, go through the alley. Ahead of time, I'll knock on all my neighbors' doors and go, hey, I'm going to mow all the grass and clean up all the trash that's back here. If you have anything that you'd like to be dumped, just stack it at the end of your property and I'll pick it up Saturday. When I made that proposal and I said, you know what, I've thought about running for some sort of leadership office in this city or at least being some sort of liaison to help the people around me instead of relying on a phone call for a system that's so aloof and doesn't know any of our names that how are they going to help? Especially if it's a nonviolent crime. So when I mentioned that I have thought about some sort of leadership within my neighborhood, my neighbors lit up. Like, oh, you will? You will consider it? And I bring up these stories because of the burden of leadership. I keep looking around for someone else to do this. Especially those that are older than me, more established, have more disposable income, etc. But if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And that's where the burden of leadership falls. I keep hearing a title, especially that was a title used for President Barack Obama. And that's, he's a community organizer. Well, a community organizer can transform a community. Because I saw my neighborhood band together against this problem and realize that, yes, I should take a more active role in what's happening in the world around me, not just sending out a tweet on Twitter and looking at all these other ass clowns that pretend they know what they're talking about about Chaz. And by the way, the people that keep shooting up Chaz and Chop, thanks for ruining it. <laughs> I know there's shooting crimes that happen all over the state, but anytime one of those crimes happens, just everybody pounces on it. Because all eyes are on this Chaz Chop situation. And I'm the only person I know that's been there that doesn't live there. Outside of a couple journalists online. All right, moving on. So the power of community organizing can transform a people. And this leads me to Malcolm X. I watched Malcolm X for the first time this week. Why did it take so long? I don't know. 
But this system has let me down before. Folks, I didn't even know who James Baldwin was until my late 20s. And when I read his words and listened to his interviews, I was so pissed because he is right. James Baldwin was right. And the system of oppression is trying to sweep his writings under the rug. Push him to the side. Just, oh, he was one of those people around the Martin Luther King Jr. times, but we fixed it all. It's okay. You don't have to study his words. Oh, yes, you do. Read James Baldwin. I remember many years ago, I was young. I don't think I had double digits yet. Maybe I did. This is during the Academy Awards, and it was, I believe, the Academy Awards where Jennifer Lopez was wearing that famous dress. And there was a number of interviews happening on the red carpet, and Denzel Washington was there as his wife, Pauletta Washington. And the interview asked her, you know, what are you thankful for? And Denzel Washington says, I'm thankful for my wife's dress. And the way he said it and the way he smiled and his wife smiled and the reporter smiled, it was such a class act. And I remember my parents turning to me and saying, that man is a class act. Denzel Washington is a gentleman. And I'm grateful for my parents to point that out to me because that attitude, that poise, that wonderful candor and honesty and love that came from Denzel Washington in those six words has never left me. And so with that in my mind years ago and obviously enjoying the career of Denzel Washington, I dove into Malcolm X, directed by Spike Lee. It starts in the glory of Harlem, showcases his life as a hustler, the zoot suits. At first I'm like, whoa, they're so colorful. Well, of course they were. The photography back then was all in black and white. Didn't really get to see those amazing colors. But those zoot suits were something else. After going through his life of hustling, he finds himself in jail. But Malcolm receives a message that changes him. There's great power in this message that he feels, a message tailored for the black experience in America. And that message is from the Nation of Islam. As I quote in the movie, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his teachings are trying to uplift the black man and black woman to separate them from the, the devils and the struggles and the trials of what the white colonizers have put upon them. And the change within Malcolm and the performance of Denzel learning these truths, thinking about his previous life and then adapting them and moving forward. He excels with this message. People listen to the message and the fire that goes hand in hand in the words of Malcolm X after he leaves jail and joins this movement, this religion, this group. And then the Brother Johnson moment. I was not really familiar with the whole Brother Johnson incident outside of what Dave Chappelle has talked about. That scene is never going to leave me, along with many others. But that, to me, is what it means to take care of your community, to take care of your neighbor. How profound. And I am the cop... <laughs> Oh, the cop. And there's a lot of a lot of good actors that had cameo roles or small roles in this, but the cop that says, you know, no man should have that much power. Well, having that much power and a man with that much power is how they were able to make changes and fight against the oppressive state. What a what a scene. Off to get Brother Johnson. Continuing in the story. Denzel falls in love, gets married to Angela Bassett's character. <laughs> it's such... Uh, <laughs> you can feel the chemistry between them, but there's a phone call where I think they've only gone on one date. At least that's what's showcased in the movie. And Denzel proposes to her over the phone. <laughs> and she has no hesitation. She says yes first and then breathes <laughs> to see if she made the right decision. But yeah, uh, so tangible and so... Wonderful to see that displayed on film and to see two actors bring that to life. 
As they struggle, Malcolm X and his family, to continue in the movement, the truth is revealed. And you see it on the face of Angela Bassett's character first. And just the tension of Denzel not really wanting to tackle this and accept it. But the truth was Elijah Muhammad, the leader of this movement, just like most religious leaders, took advantage of women working with him, sired children, and then cast them aside. And as Malcolm was struggling to try to accept this and he was meeting the women and talking to them face to face, they, the women would say, oh, I, I believed in Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm X would say, believe in Allah. The heartbreak, the how can this be? What a moment. What a moment. Because this was the exact moment I had when I learned the truth about Mormonism and frankly, all religions. We had been lied to. Eliza Muhammad and Joseph Smith have a lot in common. Joseph Smith did the same thing, except he tried to marry them as well. Had over 33 wives. So being in the shoes of Malcolm X, or at least your world falling apart, a world that I devoted 16 years of my life, two of which was a full-time ordained minister in Compton, Watson, South Central. You realize it was all a lie. Yet you're striving for truth. There is some truth in that message that was able to catapult Malcolm X away from a life of prison and hustling and into an organized force for the betterment of those around him. You don't have to cast out cast aside or cast out the wants, needs, desires to take care of your fellow man. That is innate in us. It's in our DNA. Religion tries to distort and pervert it. As Malcolm X was trying to seek truth and, and learn it and live it, he was taken advantage of. And his mentors now wanted to kill him. So Malcolm goes to Mecca, and I'm very... Very happy Spike Lee fought for this sequence in his film, Shooting in Egypt, because this journey shows the further evolution of Malcolm X. You see the pyramids. You see Mecca. You see a giant sea of humanity. And it created this contrast, this personal growth of Malcolm, in particular, this scene. I believe Malcolm is on a college campus. Malcolm X is on a college campus. And a white woman comes up to him and asks him, you know, I've read your teachings. I'm listening to you. What can I do to help? And Malcolm X said, nothing. And then walked off. And I laughed and kind of smiled when he said that at first. But then the choice that Spike Lee made as a director to linger on her face and sense the hurt from her. And that contrast to when Malcolm X is going on this journey in Mecca. And he drinks from the same cup and gets along with his fellow white seekers of truth. And he realized that he shouldn't judge somebody based on the color of their skin. I... I'm so grateful for Spike Lee and for artists that make these conscious choices that pain you, that almost shoving a dagger in your heart of, oh, this is so real, this is so raw, and also give you an example of healing, of change, and how you can be the change. Malcolm X holds on to the tenets of what he thinks is dear, of what's dear to him, but forms a new path, begins a, a new mosque. But the harassment continues, not just against him, but against his family. And in the movie, you can feel the buildup, and you get a sense of Malcolm X at his wit's end, trying to clearly see the faith that's in front of him. 
and the best thing that he can do as a man, husband, and father for his family. And you see the setup, the chaos, and the assassination. Which, crazy enough, Juan Carlos Esposito, who is near and dear to our hearts now, is one of the great villains of our time. The actor who betrays villains. He's a wonderful actor. But he's the one who kills Malcolm X, along with others. Giancarlo Esposito. Am I pronouncing his name right? Giancarlo. Giancarlo Esposito. I apologize. Giancarlo Esposito. He is a Danish-born American actor. Uh, but yes, he played Gus on Breaking Bad. But yeah, he was in Malcolm X along with Christopher. How do I pronounce his last name? I have to like look up. I uh, uh, Sopranos. All right, sorry for the delay, folks. Uh, Sopranos. Wikipedia. What is his name? Michael Imperioli. Michael Imperioli plays a reporter on the street speaking to Malcolm X. So you see like a lot of young and established actors contributing to this piece of art. Malcolm X embraces his destiny and they kill him. The connections are undeniable. The Empathy generated is undeniable. The scenes of Malcolm X's father shouting at the KKK members fleeing away. I'm a man! That's never left me. I'm going to be thinking about Malcolm X's father portrayed in that film. When I have to stand my ground. If somebody in my neighborhood decides to fling more than just words. Thank you, Spike Lee and other visionaries. This is why we have art. To tell the stories worth telling and to define heroes worth emulating. And at the end of the film, in the classroom, the son of Denzel and Paulette Washington, John David Washington, who has followed in his father's footsteps, did such an amazing job in Black Klansman, and now the world is waiting with bated breath to see Tenet. John David Washington shouts, I am Malcolm X! What a film, what a man, what a legend. And what a lesson of history it is to see what the climate and the context of the audience and the people in America and around the world were, what they thought of Malcolm at the time, how unpopular he was amongst the outsiders, and how today, deservedly so, he is in the same paragraph, in the same conversation, in the same breath as those that have given their lives for a better world. Thank you, Malcolm X. Thank you for living a life that has proven that you and I are separated via time. Maybe we're separated generation, uh, generationally, but we are not separated when it comes to the human experience and what it means to be a man. A lot of emotions today, folks. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, other than that brief little tissy fit I had with uh, somebody in my neighborhood, I'm great. I'm doing good. I got plenty of projects ahead of me. I got plenty of housework to do, and I am so satisfied working in nature <laughs> when I can. Take care of yourselves, wear your mask, and I'll, I will uh, 
definitely be here next week, but I'm just thinking, what? where is July going to take us? Where is July going to take us? We're almost done with June. Hopefully we can celebrate our independence internally this year and those that decided to buy fireworks early and light them off at 1043 at night. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, watch Malcolm X. Uh, go ahead and leave in the comments below if you do watch the film. What were your favorite, uh, favorite points, uh, favorite moments? And what type of film would you like to see John David Washington in next? <laughs> you know, after we see Tenet. Imagine Denzel and his son being in a film together. That'd be cool. Okay, thanks again. I will see you soon.